Welcome, everyone. We are going to get started in a minute. Uh, my name is Ed Frank, and I'm the CEO of Access Innovation, broadcasting live from my basement in Tel Aviv, Israel. Okay, we're gonna start now. Welcome everyone to the Access Innovation Global Investor Webinar. And I hope that all of you participating are doing well and staying healthy during these difficult times. Access Innovation is a boutique advisory firm globally connecting investors and corporations with the best technology startups. We work with more than a dozen international companies such as Visa, Centrica, Kimberly Clark, and created the Make It Drivable campaign for Ford annually for the past five years, which has had us scout innovative startups in the mobility space in 15 countries. Over the last decade, we've organized more than 100 events in 20 countries, and we very much believe in meeting potential business partners face to face. We thought about how to pivot our business in these unprecedented times, and today we're launching Access Webinars a series of virtual events about the most critical issues facing startups and investors today. For today's webinar, we're bringing the international perspective to your home. We have over 600 registered attendees from over 40 countries to hear from our distinguished panel of investors from the US, UK, France, and Israel. We'd be very happy to see how we can help you source innovative startups if you are a corporation or investor. And if you're a startup, we'll keep you informed about projects that could be relevant for you. At this point, I'd like to thank our sponsors, IBEX Investors and DLA Piper, who made this webinar possible and introduced the global law firm DLA Piper with offices in more than 40 countries that have worked closely with Axis for many years and my good friend, Jeremy Lessman, partner at DLA Piper. Jeremy, good afternoon. Thanks, Ed, good afternoon. Hi, everyone, welcome. Hope everybody is doing well, holding up okay, and keeping safe uh, in the privacy of your own homes. Uh, it's a real privilege to be uh, collaborating with Access again, with Ed and with Jason and with their wonderful team. Uh, you know, leave, leave it, leave it to their creativity in the midst of what we're going through to pull together something as uh, robust as this. I understand that there are over 600 registrants from 40 countries, and it's a privilege to spend uh, just a minute. Uh, introducing uh, the panel. Uh, our topic today, of course, is global investors. Where are we going? Maybe you see that above you. And the question for where are we going for me and for I think for most of us is we're going nowhere. We're home. We're not going anywhere today. But figuratively, of course, where are we going once this is all over is, uh, I think, a real concern and a real question of the day. Uh, you know, how do we cope with what we're going through? How do we identify uh, the silver linings in terms of where we are and 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 once we hopefully emerge sooner sooner rather than later from the crisis that we're in hopefully many of us will emerge stronger and uh, you know and, and and find the right ways of moving forward and I think one of the one of the signature um, points that a lot of emerging companies have, one of the value propositions that, that they have is that they have the ability to work so closely with such a strong investor base. And the investors these days and with, uh, amongst our distinguished panel are not investors that are simply providing capital, but these are investors who are really truly trusted advisors. They're there to be alongside their companies. They're there to help them thick and thin through times, challenging times like the ones that we're in right now. And I think that value, uh, you know, is, is, is really priceless. Uh, the, the, the concept, the idea of having a trusted advisor alongside you is really critical, especially in a time like this. And uh, from our firm perspective, I, I, I lead our Israel practice. Uh, we work with many Israeli startups and emerging companies of all shapes and sizes and help navigate them around the world. And what really drives us is, is trying to mimic the investors that you're about to hear from in terms of being trusted advisors, recognizing that in our world, the services that we're providing are legal, but really the, the heart and soul of 
the opportunities that we have to help companies is really to be alongside them as trusted advisors. So without further ado, again, I, I wish everyone the best of health uh, through this period. Wish everyone a good holiday uh, as we approach the holidays next week. And I'll hand it back over to Jason who will moderate the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you, Ed. It's great to be here virtually with everyone. I'm Jason, COO and Duoflow Manager here at Access Innovation. Welcome to the first in our new series, Access Webinars, covering the most critical topics facing startup entrepreneurs today. As mentioned, this first one is discussing one of the most critical, which is fundraising. At Access Innovation, we have over a decade of experience working both with early stage startups and investors all over the world and are excited to have a fantastic panel to share their insights and advice for startups on navigating this challenging time. As we're all working out of our homes, despite this nice background here of the Paris Center in Tel Aviv, where we've done many of our events, we're all working from home. So we're gonna do our best not to get interrupted by any kids or hopefully any technical issues as we move forward. We understand everyone's time is very valuable. And so we're grateful you've chosen to spend it with us. We're gonna keep this moving, keep it really interesting the entire time. The format of this webinar is a virtual roundtable for the next 30 minutes or so, where we'll have time for Q&A. On your Zoom application, you have a Q&A button. We encourage you to use that to ask any questions. We'll do our best to get to everyone's question during the time that we have. Please add your name as well when you send a question. I'm also going to have a poll towards the end about future webinars to get you engaged for our next one. Without further ado, let's begin. I'd like to allow our panelists to introduce themselves as well as add a short anecdote about how you are holding up managing work and life being from home. Our four panelists, we have Adam Eisenberg, partner at Ibex Investors, based in Israel and New York, Francois Paulus, a partner at Briga Capital in Paris, France, Jonathan Tudor, Innovation Director at Centrica Innovations, and Shelley Porges, Managing Partner at the Billion Dollar Fund for Women based out of Washington, DC. Adam, uh, please start uh, yourself. Sure, thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much, Jason, Jeremy, and everybody, all the panelists and everybody for joining today. Uh, my name is Adam Eisenberg. I'm a partner at Ibex Investors. We are a Denver, Colorado-based firm. I'm actually uh, situated between, uh, right now, Tel Aviv and New York. Uh, we manage a, a little over a half a billion dollars investing solely in Israel. Um, that's a mix between listed companies and private companies. On the private side of our, of our portfolio, uh, in the last eight plus years, we've invested in over 22 companies, have had seven exits, uh, we do credit access for quite a number of those successes, um, intros, as well as successes on the exit side, and we're looking forward to many more from them. Um, we, the investment side of where we invest, we start from really early, I, I'd say kind of post-seed, um, some traction, some revenue, all the way up to kind of, you know, A, B, C, and, and, and on. Um, fortunately, uh, as of recent, we've uh, re recently raised a, a fund a new venture venture focused fund, um, and we've uh, we we have capital, and we're uh, ready to go invest. In terms of Jason's question of how I'm coping, not easy. Um, I live on a plane, and uh, when friends call me and say how are you doing, and I say I'm doing okay, and they say, well, no, really, how are you doing? Because in the last 15 years, you've never stayed put for this long. Um, I'm <laughs> I'm hoping that this, that we get a, a vaccine more than anybody else. So, um, but in, in all seriousness, we're we're coping well, um, we're hungered down. Um, it's great family time and um, you know, we're doing the best we can. Okay, thank you, Francois. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Francois Paulus. I'm a co-founder of a fund called Briga. I co-founded it seven years ago. We do mostly seed and series A uh, and we are digital generalist fund, so we can do a bit of everything. We don't do medtech and we don't do biotech because that's too specific for us. Uh, we have about 45 portfolio companies uh, and around 250 million uh, under management. We invest mostly in Europe, uh, maybe 60% in France and 40% rest of Europe, a couple of deals in the US. And 
how am I coping with this uh, confinement? Because we are uh, pretty much confined here in, in France. Um, funnily enough, because I have a garden, I've never been so much outside since I'm confined inside. Um, so it's a pretty uh, strange uh, time, to be honest. Thank you. And Jonathan. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Tudor from Centrica. Centrica is a global energy company. We're about a $40 billion uh, revenue business, primarily out of the UK, but operations in, in North America and, and for B2B uh, internationally as well. So one of the teams I, I manage is a, an investment team um, which invests primarily from Israel to the West Coast. We have um, 11 investments to date, 100 million sterling fund that we're allocating. And again, I think that's cross energy, but that's across mobility, that's across home services, just managing that energy transition as the, as the world's going more and more increasingly to uh, decarbonize energy future. Uh, I guess the anecdote about it, I, I pretty much travel a lot as well. I think this is the longest period of time I've spent with my family. So I'm, I'm just enjoying that and, and not living in a city for once and enjoying the countryside. So I'm looking at the positive side of it. Thank you. And Shelly. Hey, Porgus. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of the Billion Dollar Fund for Women and also the new Beyond the Billion. The, we started, uh, launched the Billion Dollar Fund for Women um, in uh, late 2018 as an, a way to address the massive gender venture funding gap. Now, we're all familiar with the gender pay gap and often in the US at least it's references about 80% on the dollar. Well, women only get two, a little over 2% as of 2019, about 2.7% of all venture funding, women only founding teams. And even if you count gender diverse teams, which we do uh, with even one woman founder on the team, uh, that's only another 14%, meaning 83% uh, of all venture capital is going to male only founding teams. And nothing wrong with that. Men are great, men are innovative, all of that. But when we look at some of the innovations we're leaving on the table, and I'll be talking about a couple of them vis-a-vis -vis some of the companies that we're invested in and our funds are invested in. Uh, we we uh, mobilized since launching in October of 2018, in nine, less than nine months, we mobilized over a billion dollars of commitments from a global consortium of over 80 venture funds uh, that have pledged to invest some of their portfolio. And most of these are not gender lens funds that do only gender lens investing, but uh, some of their portfolio to increase it by in aggregate over a billion dollars now uh, toward companies that have at least one woman founder who's on the cap table in a meaningful way and in leadership in a meaningful way. And the reason why that's important is not just because women fuel innovation as well, but it's also because um, uh, there's a growing body of research that shows when you have gender diverse teams, it improves your returns. So as an investor, this is something you should care about. And as one of our our first uh, 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 fund that pledged in Canada, um, the male GP, and he was our first male GP as well, uh, said, he said, look, uh, you know, let's face it, women are the most undervalued asset in the world, and this is an arbitrage opportunity, and you're missing out if you don't get in on this. And we're seeing that to be true. So first round capital showed that when they looked at their portfolio over 10 years, over 350 companies, those that where they had women or gender diverse teams that performed 63% better IRR than, than male only teams. And I could go on and on, but I know I only have a couple of minutes. I will say I'm a proud Israeli American. I came to America when I was five years old. Uh, happy always to return to my homeland when I can. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I had a career, uh, have had a trisectoral career myself, starting in the corporate world uh, at American Express, Bank of America, ending up as chief marketing officer for Bank of America during a historic turnaround. Uh, uh, that was the largest turnaround in American corporate history at the time uh, when we had it in the late 80s. And then uh, moved on from that to an entrepreneurial career where uh, I lived in the Bay Area for 18 years. and. Uh, started, founder, co-founded six companies, five of them financial services companies, one of them being the first ever online IPO platform. But unfortunately, just before the markets crashed in, in 2000. So with that, I'll just, I'll just leave it. And then, and then the third part of my trisectoral career is, um, uh, is government, where I worked for Hillary Clinton for eight years. I served uh, in the state, at the State Department as her senior advisor for global entrepreneurship and literally worked all over the world. 
um, you know, uh, advancing entrepreneurial ecosystems where we grew the program to almost 150 countries. So today, as we, we stand as the Billion Dollar Fund for Women in over 80 countries, we have a way to go. But we've launched beyond the billion to also bring in LP investors. Now we're beginning to get engagement from LP investors to invest into our venture funds that are investing in women. And that way, tr we're trying to create a virtuous cycle that will address this gender venture funding gap. So that's our story. Okay. Thank you, Shelley. So let's jump right in to our first question, which is dealing with portfolio. So how are you guys dealing with your current portfolio companies? How is this affecting them, your relationship, your time, your capital? And uh, let's go back and I'll throw this question first to you, Adam. Sure. So we've um, probably like many other panelists here on the, on, the, uh, on the call, you know, first advice we told everyone is cut fast to survive or cut slow and you won't. Um, I think that's the message we've told everyone, and um, it's been very, very successful thus far. We don't know how long this is going to last, um, so you kind of have to hunker down first, but then cash is king, and I can't repeat that enough, um, because if you have it, it's great, you want more of it, and if you don't have it, get it. Um, you know, to that point, in the last two weeks, we've raised over $78.5 million in our portfolio companies. That's in the last two weeks. So for us, in order to really bolster the balance sheets for these companies, um, we've had cash. Um, now we're actually going on the offensive. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give some, some anecdotal uh, um, you know, points later, but I think we've seen some, some really, really amazing wins um, with customers in the last couple of days that you know, blew, us, blew us away. So I, th I think, again, you, know, you really have to, you know, first lesson, cut fast, and then, and then you know, reassess, and then move forward. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan and Francois. I, the only thing I'd add to that is this time it feels a little bit different than it did in, say, 2008 and 2009, which was largely caused by the credit crunch, right? It was a financially triggered crisis, whereas this isn't. So people's behavior seems to be more engaging this time around. I've certainly had portfolio uh, companies and investments that have managed to close um, pretty major deals over Zoom, right? Uh, with somebody walking around with an iPhone inspecting de due diligence on a manufacturing plant, right? Which would never happen before. People would have wanted that face to face. So I think people are willing to be a little bit more creative. Um, in addition to, you know, cut slow uh, and die versus, you know, cut fast and survive. I think they take the opportunity of what I've been saying to a lot of portfolio companies to really be clear, especially if they're earlier stage businesses that you've got a really crystal clear product market fit, right? So is your product perfect? Is your uh, product or your solution really optimized to what the customer wants? There's a lot of people who've got a lot more screen time now. They're not commuting. So we're in front of devices a lot more. You'll be, we're certainly seeing people willing to talk for longer to take the opportunity to engage with customers and people to make sure your solution is really fit for the market you want to address and focus down on the ones where you think you're getting strongest engagement. Yeah, I think, I think for us, we, the first week we called all of them, the 45 of them, and I don't know, I don't have a percentage, but some of them were skeptical of what we were asking. We were asking them, you know, you should have cash for the next 12 to maybe 24 months and you should make mm -hmm. uh, scenarios of maybe no revenue or, or mm -hmm. no revenue cut by two or three or whatever. And why was I skeptical? Because I think most of them are quite young and they haven't lived through 2008 and they haven't lived through 2000. So they, the two major crises that we have lived through, I have lived through anyway, uh, they didn't know them. So now after, after two weeks, uh, I think they realized that you, there was a, re a reason why we asked for these uh, cash plans. And so now, uh, as Adam said, everyone is like working like crazy, uh, understanding cash is king and, and, and at the same time trying to make a business. Shelly, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, just to be um, to elaborate, you know, our over 80 funds invest all across the board from AI robotics, ag tech, clean tech, fintech, cannabis, blockchain, you name, you name a category and, and we've got funds investing in it. Um, having said that, um, what the, you know, three things that we think are really critical. Obviously, one is managed cash flow without a doubt. I think we're all focused on that. Secondly, um, all of our funds, we're in a mid-cohort uh, uh, assessment now. We have a 
two year runway for all of our funds to invest this over a billion dollars ending in 2020 because we began in 2018. Um, and uh, the other thing is communicate, 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 communicate with your investors, communicate with your team, communicate with your um, customers. Uh, and, you know, we think, well, of course, but, you know, you'd be amazed. I, I sent out a note about, I, I got an investor letter from, uh, you know, one of our companies that we've invested in, and uh, it was fantastic. So we sent it out to everybody saying, this is what you should be doing. Here's a great example of how to communicate with other investors, right? So communicate is the second thing. And then I think uh, Francois mentioned it, but it's, it's revisit all of your assumptions, whether it's your assumptions about your revenues, whether it's your assumptions about your team, whether it's your assumptions about every, any and every aspect. Uh, and, then, and then look at the three scenarios to simplify things and look at what you hope to be true, which is theoretically the medium, the worst that could happen in your view right now in terms of your assumptions and, and ideally something better or the best that could happen. But, but be prepared in, in all those ways, have a contingency plan. And to that end, one of our fund managers, Heather Henyon at Mindship Capital, based in Dubai, um, they are a $50 million fund and they, um, she's put together a, an amazing scorecard, very simple to use, but fairly comprehensive uh, about, you know, so that, uh, you know, Francois, you mentioned, we also have so many early stage companies that they're fairly inexperienced. They don't even know what to think about, what questions to ask. And this scorecard helps guide them. So we, we are looking actually to do a webinar ourselves featuring Heather presenting her scorecard. She did one yesterday for another organization that I, I uh, you know, chimed, you know, I, I uh, listened to. Uh, and I, I really think it's a marvelous template for any, any young company or, or mature company to be following and, and not that difficult to do so, at least at a high level. It's harder to do the work that goes under it, but those are, but those are three of the things that I would highlight. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of you, you have an example of a company, a specific example, you can say the name or maybe say generally of one that you think really did something well, you know, they sat down with their team, they sat down with their customers, investors, an example of a company or portfolio that is doing something that you think would be a good example for other entrepreneurs to know about? Well, I, I would say I, we have three companies I wanted to feature among many, many, but who, who are, you know, in the heart of the storm here uh, that have really pivoted to, so one is um, a mobile ventilator producer in Canada um, who is quintupling her production, you know, their production. She was founded and, and, and led by a woman uh, in Canada. Uh, another one in, in Boston does uh, accelerated viral testing. Now, they weren't virus testing for flu or anything like COVID. And of course, shifted the entire operation and are, will be launching. Today's April 1st, so this month, no, no fooling. <laughs> They'll be launching their version of a COVID test this month. That's an accelerated test. And then the third one is an ARVR manufacturer uh, in California. Again, woman-led, uh, woman-founded, woman-led, uh, that is using the VR um, uh, program they have to uh, train social workers and healthcare workers in senior living facilities and shifting it to COVID training, COVID-related training, as new people are coming into the system, as people are coming in from retirement that we're hearing and so many more healthcare workers are gonna be need to be recruited. And then, you know, even if you have medical training, you're gonna need some new updated information. And so she and her company, we had a long conversation with her the other day, how she is shifting to and pivoting to trying to provide a service here uh, and add in some, uh, you know, some uh, content, let's say, uh, that will help train up uh, the increased uh, healthcare uh, teams that we'll need. So these are three companies that I think have done a magnificent job of, you know, both taking advantage of the opportunity, although they're not increasing their prices or anything, but, but really trying to be of service with what they do. Okay, thank you. Uh, other panelists? Sure, I'll, 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 jump in real, uh, I'll jump in real quick. And um, I think there's a couple of examples um, on the more established companies. Um, I, think, I think what we've talk to the companies and understand, go through customer by customer, line item by line item, as opposed to indiscriminately saying, oh, there's a 20% haircut, that's one scenario, 30% haircut. You have to, you can't treat every customer equally. So if it's the aviation, airlines, if it's um, financial services, you have to understand what, how each one is, is gonna properly be potentially impacted. 
Um, I think for the earlier investments, investments um, you know, we encourage possibly CLAs as a bridge until they do a, a price round later um, in order to get them through the next round. Um, that's, that's something that's been um, accepted. And, and then we have another company, an investment, um, a company called Revel, which is um, uh, scooters in the US, and they've actually been offering free rides to healthcare workers. So um, I think that there, again, no, no company is created equal in this environment. And I think you have to be able to, uh, to adapt and, and, and advise um, in real time. Um, you know, as Francois said before, you know, having conversations, you know, uh, Shelly did as well, having conversations with, with your companies um, daily uh, is, is, uh, is quintessential to this environment. Yeah, maybe I could add two quick examples. I have one company in the UK, they used to sell on the spot insurance for cars because in the UK, um, it's not the car which is inside, but the person. And of course, uh, in the current environment, business was like divided by infinite almost. Uh, but at the same time, they thought, well, maybe, you know, some people from the NHS that don't use a, a car, usually they need a car now to, to go and, and treat people. So they managed to, you know, uh, continue to do some business in that difficult environment uh, because they, they, they think out of the box maybe. Um, and I have a second example, it's a company called On Off in Paris. They, they sell numbers, uh, you know, for, for second number or third number for your, for your phone. And they were not really struck and on the contrary, because many people work from home as a, a lot of businesses contacted them to buy numbers. And uh, of course, at the same time, they, they, they gave away free numbers for uh, uh, health staff who want to do teleconsultation now, but they don't want to give their own personal number because in a couple of months, they don't want you know, uh, everyone to have their own personal number. So I think it's a couple of examples there. I guess the only, I'd add one, uh, I was just thinking about this. It's, it's actually coincidentally an all, all female team out of Boston, a, a company called Hello Alfred. They, they, mm -hmm manage a kind of digital concierge service for apartment buildings and there's a physical person an alfred that's responsible for carrying out chores and tasks in that in that building and they've as a team even before this uh, brilliant execution superb and what it's something back that shelley said about how you can take leadership as a small company and how you communicate to customers stakeholders clients and uh, I'd highlight here, I mean, they've got three, maybe 400 um, employees who are these Alfreds in the building. I mean, they potentially are exposed as, as well as anybody else. And it's, it's how they've engaged all that stakeholders, the employees, clients and stakeholders as in a way of communicating what's happening with the business is, is, has kind of reassured everybody at the time that they were closing around and they managed to close around um, and continue the business and grow their business. So, I think it was the leadership they just showed in the way that that communication was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you guys. Let me throw a question to you, Francois. At your fund, Briga Capital, you guys have invested quite a bit in uh, FinTech and InsureTech. How do you see these industries evolving? Uh, do you think there's going to be significant challenges or opportunities that come up after this? Yeah, we have, um, Thanks for that question. We, we have one of our funds who is dedicated to FinTech and InsurTech at, at defined at large. And actually we've made the analysis of the impact of this crisis for these companies. And because it's so much diverse, some of them there is like no impact or, or, or mild impact on the payment uh, side and payments are still going on. And in some cases it's going up, some cases it's going down, but it's not disappeared. And, um, other examples, mostly maybe in insurance. I mean, the, the example I quoted just before from the UK, I, I mean, of course, there were quite, quite a, a problem for them, that, like the on-the-spot market for car insurance. Um, we have another one where uh, we were about to launch, and it, it's, it's an app to allow people to invest, uh, let's make it short, but to invest uh, uh, more easily in the stock market. And, and we are thinking, well, should we launch now? or not because many people who are not experts of the stock markets because it's going down, they think they should invest now, but you know, maybe it's not a good idea. I don't know, I don't want to comment on that. So we have this sort of ethical question of should we launch or not? Because maybe it's gonna uh, help people to invest now in the stock market and maybe it's not a good idea. So in a nutshell, there's no, I mean, there's no like in, in the travel industry or, or, or 
in the event industry, I mean, there's a clear answer that everything is, is going down. In the fintech and short tech industry, it's so diverse that um, some are going up, some are going down. So there's no clear, clear answer to that one. Understood. Jonathan, you focus a lot on energy at Centrica and have several investments across water, smart homes, security, and other fields. So same question to you. I'm really curious to get your thoughts. What challenges or opportunities do you see in these industries? I mean, in some regards, like it's an energy, this is just one thing none of us can really live without, right? Um, and so that doesn't go away. It just shifts how we're using energy at the moment. I mean, all the hotels and restaurants close. I mean, that's in volume, that's quite a significant part for us, uh, margin, et cetera. When I look at our portfolio companies in this space, I think coming out of this, there's, there's a greater understanding of how these shifts are gonna take place, right? You, you suddenly realize how dependent we are on, on, on elements of these services around energy. We've already seen a transition to uh, increased awareness about how do you be best make use of renewables, et cetera. I don't think any of that fundamentally is going to change. I, whether it creates a, a greater sense of urgency or a greater sense of, of community um, around how we then come together and, and use energy in a different way, that's one that's one potential thing I'm looking out for off the back of this. And so we can get more into community-based assets of storage, solar, wind, et cetera. And then the business model for how these can be adopted and accepted um, may well change. That's our expectation. It's too early to say there's any signs of that. But fundamentally, uh, we do, we're just hoping and just seeing this is just going to be a temporary pause. And then the fundamentals of, of, of market need shouldn't shift they may accelerate is what um, in some markets we're, we're hoping. Makes sense. Thank you. Adam, let me ask you a question about your strategy about new investments and portfolio investments. And then we'll share this with the rest of the panelists too. What's your balance in terms of time and capital between taking care of your portfolio and saving an extra dry powder and capital for them versus new potential investments? That's a great question. Uh, so we're a unique structure in the sense that our hybrid fund um, is, is an open-ended fund. So we're fortunately, and actually, I don't want to call it that surprising, but you know, as, as Israel is the innovation, um, we're, we're, having, we're seeing inflows. Um, investors are investing. You know, today, uh, we, we've had a bunch of money come in, and people have actually committed um, to continue to put more money in. So we know we have um, capital to deploy. Um, and we're, so that fund is, is, is a balance. I'd say, uh, you know, we're open. Um, you know, we want, we want entrepreneurs to come and ready to deal with us, um, but, but be realistic. And, but, but obviously a lot of the emphasis is working on the existing companies. Um, you know, as we talked earlier in the earlier questions about dealing with what's out there, how, um, how can they survive, but not only survive, but how can they thrive? So go from defensive to offensive. And I think that, you know, I, I don't want people to take away that everything is just hunkered down and no one's doing business. Business is, 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 is still progressing, obviously, at a different pace, um, but we're working with our existing companies. As we said before, we, we launched uh, a new venture fund right now. Um, we, two, we have two great colleagues on the ground um, in Israel who are focused uh, day in and day out. Um, as you can imagine, it, it's been a bit of a fire hose um, as they are getting a, an inordinate amount of um, opportunities sent their way. Um, so I think that that's obviously, that's a great opportunity. Um, we, we've actually raised a, a decent amount of money in the last week um, as investors look at this and it, it's an unencumbered. Um, there is no baggage. There's it's a clean slate. So it, it's a nice balance for us. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, as we're all hands on deck and everybody's looking, there's a balance between existing portfolio and, and, and new opportunities. Shelley, Jonathan, uh, Francois, anybody like to comment? Well, one of, one, of the, one of the things we found, like everyone else, we, we've been doing outreach. Well, we've been doing outreach for months now because we were in a midterm, what we call our midterm assessment of how uh, how funds are pledged relative to, you know, how much of the funds that have been pledged have actually been invested. And so we're, you know, monitoring them, making sure that that's progressing uh, actively. Uh, beyond that, though, what we're finding is that um, funds that are in the later stages of their fund round, that is, 
who are planning potentially to raise funds again in 2021 or whatever as they're winding down their, whether it's fund one, two, or three right now, um, are generally holding more of that capital for their current portfolio companies to, to support them, sustain them, and ensure that they've got the returns that way. Funds that are in the earlier stages, whether they've just closed the round or closed the round you know, in the last year and they have a lot to deploy, are deploying it. And they're deploying it into new companies. And whether they're, you know, and we, we, you know, they're being deployed across the spectrum depending on the fund, um, it, from you know, pre-seed, seed, early, late growth, uh, all of the above. And there it's, there's definitely investment going on, you know, deals that were already being scrutinized, were already being diligenced, are, are continuing. And many of them have closed actually in the last couple of weeks. So a lot of that has not slowed down if that was already underway. Obviously, the biggest challenge for those uh, funds and most of the funds want to continue to invest one way or the other, as I said, uh, and again, you know, the older funds would be about two thirds into their portfolio companies, the you know, earlier stage, uh, not early stage funds, but, but, but funds that are in the beginning of their runway uh, would be deploying to new companies. But they're all having, obviously, and we will all have a slightly tougher time uh, diligencing some of the companies, depending on what kind of company it is and whether or not you really need, you know, someone on the ground to really, you know, kick the tires or whether, it, you know, you can do a digital financial assessment and, and everything else we do for diligencing um, digitally. Um, I guess the last point I'd make there is the opportunity that I see coming up. Uh, which is something we've been discussing among our funds as well uh, in the past, but now I think there might be a slightly more demand for it, is the opportunity to co-invest where the diligence has been done by one fund already, they have potentially closed on there, but to present opportunities to some of our other partner funds to say, look at, here's a woman founded business or a you know, gender diverse team doing an amazing things, you know, great innovation and, uh, and we believe great, you know, market opportunity, et cetera, here, and we're willing to share our diligence with you for you to come in and bring that capital in that where you can't do the diligence yourself or not the full diligence anyway. So I think that that's an opportunity that may emerge from that kind of a scenario. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the, the key question today that we are being asked by entrepreneurs, of course, is do you still invest? Are the VCs still investing? And as far as we are concerned at, at Briga, what we have decided is we will uh, close the deal that we were about to close, i.e. when we had a term sheet signed. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the case of everyone. I have examples in my own portfolio where we, was about, we were about to raise a, a Series B and we had a term sheet and the funds just vanished. So it's, it's a sad story, but it does happen because of coronavirus. And for new deals, what we've said, it's, it's still a people business. So what we've said is we can go as far as we can for new deals and make everything in Zoom, Hangout, WebEx, whatever. But to sign a check, we need to, to meet the people. So we've been very clear about that, that we can. And so we, because we are all working from home, we have time to, 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 to initiate deal flow and, and talk to people, but we're not able to, to, to go until the end before we, we actually meet the people. That's not possible for us. I think it's fair to say that and not to lie to the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I think a, another point that people don't focus on if you're not actually the investor, uh, you know, if you're on the other side, is that, you know, as investors, we have to deploy our capital at some point. You know, it, you know, our returns effectively go down if we're, you know, and, and our exits or, or every other aspect of what, me, you know, comes to be measured as our own performance goes down over time. So given an, an assumption that I have that this is not a you know, two, three, four month thing, but the, the impacts here will be medium to longer term at best, that you know, at some point, uh, I, I agree with Francois, I mean, this is the challenge. You want to be able to kick the tires in person. <laughs> you wanna meet the people. You wanna have those conversations. But having said that, uh, to the degree that we can find any other effective proxies and or, uh, we, we, you know, there's some pressure on, on investors to invest. Otherwise, over the long term, your returns are going down. And we are actually now exploring some really interesting new structures that will be able to provide LPs some liquidity early on and still allow us to maintain the, um, the cash reserves. And we're actually looking even to partner with the organization that does this. Uh, it's, it's, you can think of it as a VC hedge fund, if you will, but, but, but it, you know, in a good way. Um, and, and we're looking at other capital structures to 
say, what are some other solutions instead of just going down this, you know, path that we've always been on that's worked well for us so far, you know, mm -hmm. let's look at some, some new things that, that, that could help us in these very, um, you know, unprecedented times. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, is there anything you'd like to add from the CVC perspective? I, nothing which is anything different. I guess from our point of view, again, if, if it, I kind of look at it to see what kind of percentage uh, ownership I'm looking to take. If we're not in the lead round, I, I'm increasingly comfortable, like Shelley said, is if the lead is comfortable with the team and everything, and we're, we're going to be a super minority in, investor, right? And if, if we trust the due diligence and we can match it as much as we can just by Zoom, et cetera, then I'd, I'd rather go with that and see some companies survive and get into some deals that um, otherwise may have not got into. And do just, it, in essence, we're just taking a little bit more risk, but we're just all taking that risk together as shareholders, right? And, and if, if we're comfortable with the lead and we can trust the lead investor, then I'm encouraging everybody to think a little bit more creatively. Thank you. So we're going to go to our Q&A right now. But before that, if you might have noticed on your screen, a poll popped up. We'd love to get your feedback. Just takes a second. So you'll see that. I see we've got a lot of people already answering it. Now, let's go into the Q&A. We got a ton of questions. So I just picked a few that we'll start going through. So the first one is from uh, Giovanni in Italy. So this was a question about product market fit. So he's asking, how do you know how and for how long markets will be impacted? Because markets now and markets a few months ago and markets in the future are going to look very different. So how are you assessing companies and in this area? And I'll add something to this. How can startups plan their projections when they're looking in the future when these markets are so uncertain? And whoever wants to jump in on that first, go for it. We are doing, we are doing first of all, the exercise with our own companies before talking about new companies. And so with our own companies, where the answer is we don't know. And so we have to make scenario. And so, uh, you know, let's assume that you have no revenue for six months, 12 months, you know, whatever. So there's no other mean than to make scenario and say, if I'm in this scenario, then maybe I stop hiring. And if this one, maybe I start firing. There's, I mean, there's no clear answer. And for the new companies, for new deal flow, well, it's, it's all the more complex. So then I think we have to differentiate be, between uh, what I would call ultra seed companies from seed and series A. If, if I see an ultra seed company that has not yet started to do business, then obviously it's very, very, very difficult for me to make my opinion on whether I should invest or not, because I know they probably won't do any business for six months, 12 months, whatever. If, if there is a company that is already doing business, when then I, I'm making my assumption on, you know, how long will they, will they stop? Six months, eight months, something. but I know that they do have a, a product market fit. For, for the ultra seed companies, it's very, very difficult nowadays. Sure. And from our vantage point, we, we only invest in companies post revenue. So it solves a little bit of that problem um, where if they don't have revenues. Then, yeah, I think it's very hard to invest pre revenue at this point. Um, however, with, with the existing companies and where they're at, again, it's back to the assessment of um, what the impact could be. You have to understand the industry as opposed to just taking a haircut across the board. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the last two days, one of our companies, uh, one of our, uh, our, actually our largest company in the portfolio, not a surprise, was actually sourced by, uh, by Ed and Axis. Um, this company actually won an airline customer and a retail customer. So it's pretty surprising, but on, on the flip side, you know, you, you look at the business is still moving because, because of the fact that people are forward looking. Um, what's gonna be today is not gonna be in six months, 12 months. We don't know how to assess what the, the, the exact impact is going to be, but people will travel maybe differently. People will spend maybe differently. So therefore, business still perpetuates and business still moves forward. Um, and I think companies have to plan for that. So that, that's what we're trying to, uh, to help them do that. Thank you. All right, I'll go to the next question just so we can make sure we can get to several other ones. This is uh, from Joe. He's asking, are investors now expecting founders to focus more on being cash conscious than growth oriented? And will investors reward founders more now for being budget conscious versus growth hackers? How would uh, you guys answer this? Well, if, 
well, if you're already invested in a company as an investor, yes, you, you're looking for your uh, companies to be very, very, very focused on cash. And indeed, uh, customer acquisition now is probably not, you know, the thing that unless you can figure out a way to do it, you know, at a fraction of the cost you used to do it at, uh, that is probably not going to be it. But, you know, it really, it's very dependent on the kind of business we're talking about, whether it's, a B, you know, B2C, B2B, um, that, that, that would, uh, you know, change. And um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think it's one of the positive things, if I may say, of this crisis is over the past three years, uh, and I'm sure France is, is like a representative of many countries, over the past three years in France and Europe, many of our entrepreneurs, they got cash for, I don't know, 12 months, and they just spend and spend and spend, and then say, in any case, I'm gonna be able to raise after 12 months, there's no question, I will, I will find new investors. And sometimes we said, well, you know, uh, see what happens sometimes in, uh, and especially in, in the Bay Area where, where VCs have, have a lot of money, but sometimes they just pull the plug and say, well, that's it, it's too late. And so I think it's a good sign of the time that people will be cash conscious. It doesn't prevent you from doing growth, but you, you have to think, what if I can't raise in 12 months? And, and this is the sort of thinking that had disappeared over the past uh, two or three years. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. So let me go to the next question here. So this is from Boyd from Barcelona. And he's asking, I think, an interesting question about software companies selling to large public and private organizations, where some of these big enterprise customers are facing huge reductions in their staff and in their budget. What advice would you have in terms of business development if your customer base or your market is being severely affected by this? I, I think the answer for those companies is the same as for all. What, what does it take to sustain yourself through this challenging time where you may not be making many sales uh, until you can get back on your feet and then use this time to cultivate um, you know, connections, to you know, deliver some pro bono services if you can, to build up relationships so that when the cash comes back, and eventually it will, uh, that you can you can tip the scales, and then of course to look for new markets that do have cash right now because that's you know because they're in a different sector and or because the government is actually funding them. In the U.S. here with this new two trillion dollar thing, I mean it's going to take some time for that to trickle down, but there will be new pockets of opportunity. I guarantee you, and you know you need to be on the lookout. You know if you've been looking to serve one market and there's a new market that's going to be emerging that's going to be a better fit, that's what you'll have to look at. We'll all have to adapt. I, I yeah. guess the only thing I've had asked some of our portfolio companies to do in in that kind of environment is actually go back and look at your existing installed customers, right? And focus on the ones where you have really good existing relationships and kind of double down on those. Because as you come out of this, having exceptionally good references, having uh, even better case studies, more detailed case studies where you know, your customers may even appreciate the fact you're leaning in and even helping them out on this. There will be that uh, reciprocity. They'll, they'll remember the fact that you leaned in and helped them at a time of their own crisis. And at that point in time where it does change, you would have having a much better and stronger reference base for you is something that will allow you to then ease back into the growth and probably get ahead of your competitors. I was muted. Any other comments on this question before we go to the next? No, just, I mean, a, a, a quick comment. If, if you are in that position, you already sell to large corporate. And so the sales cycle, you are used to long sales cycles. So just, just, you know, sales cycle is going to be longer, but you're used to that environment. So don't panic and, and, and make your, your projection, your cash flow projections and, and, and stick to your cash. Okay. A, another question here that's, Francois, I think you touched on it, but it's about deal making and in-person meetings. So could, should entrepreneurs expect that they will need to actually wait to meet you or an investor in person? Would any of you consider doing a deal if you've just done the negotiations or conversations on Zoom or virtually? Okay, I'm, so I'm gonna answer from, from, from my case, and I heard the answer of the others, but for my case, because, um, you know, we have, a, I didn't say it, but we have an investment team and we have an operations team. So we're pretty much hands-on with the, 
with the startups and we help them a lot. So we tend to try to be the lead investor. In that case, that's why I want to meet face to face. Of course, if there is a deal where I'm going to take 10% of the VC round, uh, and it does happen from time to time, even for me, then maybe I, I could I could uh, uh, go for the Zoom option or something like that. But when I'm the lead investor, as of today, because maybe in one year I'm going to say something different if I, I'm still at home in one year. But as of today, uh, yeah, I need a, a physical uh, meeting at one point, definitely for me. So from, from, from our vantage point, uh, we actually just closed a deal um, in the last couple of days. Um, albeit it was started um, a couple of weeks, uh, about a, a couple of months ago. Um, but but in, in terms of Francois, I mean, I, I think we we actually will, will do as much diligence as we can. Um, you know, again, it, you know, it, it, every situation varies. Uh, I mean, as Shelley said before, she wants to, you know, you want to spend as much time, but, you know, communication is key and, and obviously we have to adapt as best as we can. Um, so for us, we're, we're, we're still open. Um, you know, again, as you know, as your, as Jason, your earlier question of the balance between, you know, existing portfolio versus um, new investments, existing portfolios do need comp do need cash um, and opportunities um, arise within the, within their their existing businesses. So we are uh, helping them, and then on, on new opportunities, you know, we have we have cash now, and we we don't have the um, the pressure to make investments tomorrow. Um, but as opportunities do arise, we're not we're not we're not slowing down. Okay, thank you. Next question from uh, Gregoire from France. Should we expect a drop of new money going into VC funds? So essentially a drop in uh, the amount of money LPs are investing into funds. Perhaps you can comment on that. And which will trickle down to availability for investments into startups. Well, maybe I, I could comment on that because we launched just at the beginning of this year our um, you know effort and our outreach to LP investors to uh, and we're seeing um, a lot of receptivity again they, they've got if it's an institutional investor I should say you know and obviously we're differentiating institutions from high net worth individuals and family offices and their foundations or whatever could be very different profiles but with institutions um, if they've got capital to deploy, they're still looking to deploy it. And if the funds have a track record where uh, they can demonstrate, even though obviously that track record will be expected to shift during this time at some level, um, that they, they have a need to deploy. Now they don't have to deploy tomorrow necessarily, but we have been getting significant pledges from LPs now uh, to be investing into, now it's gonna take some time, You know, that's not gonna get invested tomorrow or even necessarily within the next six months. Uh, you know, it's going to take some time for all the reasons we've been talking about, but um, I fully expect, uh, I mean, there's a lot of cash out there that hasn't been deployed already in the good times. Uh, and so this is going to put more pressure on LPs who are, who are for many reasons, under pressure to deploy the capital uh, and not leave it on the sidelines. It lowers their returns if they do. So, uh, so anyway, that's, you know, over time, I, I mean, I do think that we're going to see perhaps some slowdown for the reasons we've talked about, but not, you know, overall, I think there's still going to be a fair appetite for new opportunities. I think similar to Shelley, we, we also launched a fund recently and also have our, our flagship funds as an open-ended fund. So we do have the pressure, but most importantly, the partner's capital is in this as well. So we want to make money alongside with our investors and, you know, not deploying it, not, not putting it to work doesn't really give us a, a return. Um, so, so, so similar to what Shelly said, we, we, are, um, we are active, we are looking at opportunities. Um, a lot of our investors are family offices and, and high net worth individuals. So when, when they have cash, um, and, and a lot of them are very cash rich at this point, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an easier and faster cycle for them to, to allocate, which is not a surprise why in the last couple of weeks we've actually raised money. Um, we have our final close in, in the, the current VC at the end of June. And, um, you know, I, th I think we're, we're, we're on pace to, to get to that point, um, you know, e even with this uh, turmoil. I, just to give a, a kind of the corporate VC perspective, I last couple of days had a number of different conversations. Some corporates are actually doubling down. They've got more money to invest and they're saying we can finally get into deals that we couldn't do before. Others are saying we've had our cash pool, we've got no available to cash uh, to, to invest this year. So if you do have um, CVC investors or you're contemplating going to, to, to approach them, I, I just 
have that outright conversation right up front and ask them the first question I ask, have you got capital deployed this year? Uh, and have your budgets been pulled back and reinforced? Uh, otherwise, you could be wasting your, your, your time with them. But I, I think that's probably the only sector where you probably have to spend a little bit more time uh, investigating who's got cash and, and who hasn't. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do our final two questions. So last one, any other advice, just one thing that you would like to share with entrepreneurs uh, during this period from each of you? So uh, we'll start with Adam and we can just go around from there. If there's any one last piece of advice you'd like to share. So I'd, I'd, uh, I'd probably use the words of my insightful partner, Justin Boris at the last access conference was, you know, come ready to deal. Um, entrepreneurs come, you know, be realistic with your, uh, with your valuations. Uh, and, um, and then we're, we're willing to, uh, to have the conversation. Thank you. Francois? Yeah, I was going to say the same. Uh, take the money while you can get the money. And so, you know, the valuation have been a bit crazy over the past three years. So before saying no to a VC who wants to negotiate a better valuation than maybe six months ago, just think about it uh, and take the money if you can get it. Shelley? Um, you know, I, I think uh, as we're living in interesting times, as the Chinese would say, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, most entrepreneurs recognize that these are not just challenging times, but they're also times of opportunity. So look for those opportunities. First of all, do preserve your cash, do get the cash when you can, all of the things that have been said, but also recognize and look for the opportunities that are presented to us now in these dire times. And those who recognize that there's opportunity here uh, will do actually really well, I think. And uh, you know, we look forward to working with all of you if there are funds or LPs on the line that are interested in exploring more about what we have to offer and how we work with our funds, uh, we'd, be, we'd welcome you. Thank you. It's the billion, it's, we're at beyondthebillion.com. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to our panelists, to Adam, to Francois, to Jonathan, to Shelley, to Jeremy, for joining us from really all over the world, from DC, from New York, from London, Paris, Tel Aviv, and then all across Israel. I want to, of course, thank our sponsors. Thank you to DLA Piper. Thank you to Ibex for being such great uh, partners with us, really, through so many different things that we do. And certainly want to also thank the AXIS staff. So there's a lot of people behind this webinar that you don't see. So I want to give a shout out to Justine, to Darina, to Lena, to Riley, uh, who really worked so hard to make this webinar happen. So thank you so much to everyone there. We are going to be doing another webinar in two weeks on April 13th and every uh, week after that for the next three weeks. So the focus of this series of webinars in the month of April is really about these issues such as fundraising and some of the others you saw in the polls. What are the most critical things that entrepreneurs need to know that can benefit from? How can we take advantage of this period? It's challenging for everyone, but while there's challenges, there's also opportunities. So it's important to be flexible to pivot. Like us at Access Innovation, we do events. That's one of our main businesses. And now we're doing virtual events to really keep the connections going because we believe that's what makes deals happen. The numbers are important. Of course, that's really critical, but it's the people too. So even virtually, we're going to keep the people aspect going. Thank you so much, Evan, for joining us from around the world to the team and uh, panelists. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.